the old, um, I can't think of the name of what that church was, Fellowship Chapel. They were up there, but they began to seek God over a year ago about getting centrally located where they could connect with more people. And so now they are right in the old Gallup Police uh, Business College. And so, praise the Lord, right? No. Yeah. So um, that's where they're located now. Um, talk to them on the phone. They certainly, um, here's what happens. When people uh, have a need, they get a need quickly. If it's cold weather, suddenly people that uh, need, have a need of a coat need it that day. And so sometimes it's become where they are able just to drop in there and pick that item up. And I will tell you that it was such a blessing. Miss Lisa Carroll mentioned what a blessing it was to see the, um, the socks and the gloves come in the last time. So think about that. Think about those things and, uh, and bless them. Just kidding. Uh, whatever goes in there, especially if it's brand new, we will take it. So bless the Lord. Um, the next thing I want to let you know about, there's a tile for this. It's some ladies sitting at a table. And if you want to be part of our um, creative team to plan our Mother's Day event, ladies, come and see me. We have about a half a dozen people on the team already, so can we raise it up? So if you want to be part of that creative team, um, we want you to be part of that. But I need to hear from you today. If you can't talk to me at church and don't run into me, send me a message. I would love it. I'd love for you to come be on our team for the Mother's Day event, which we think that's going to be April the 30th. As you know, we always avoid Mother's Day weekend. But uh, we think the event will be April the 30th. And it seems a little crazy to think that that's just a week from Mother's Day. It's April the 30th. But this year it is, and uh, we're looking forward to it. I already had some ideas presented to us. So uh, be praying, seeking the Lord for everything. Um, next Saturday, ladies and gentlemen, Max Reyes will be with us. Can you give the Lord a hand clap? Why? Why? We should always be learning. Somebody say amen to that. We should always be learning more, more, higher, higher. And deeper, deeper. I mean, you know, I'm kind of. Uh, like uh, Janice Claypool says, she goes, you get in a Pentecostal church and I'm like, someone wants to go higher, someone wants to go deeper. <laughs> but praise the Lord, all those things are good. But Max Reyes will be our teacher on Saturday. This is a free event. If you want to be plugged in to any type of team at Rodney Pike Church of God, we're happy to say we're coming super close to our max. So praise God for that. Max is now yeah, urging the max. Got a chance to see him at some classes that Pastor and I are attending, and he's a sharp guy. He's a sharp guy. And you know one of the best things about him, too? I'm going to say it almost with tears. He's a humble person. He's, he, and, and did you ever meet somebody that has that combination and you think, oh, Jesus, bless the Lord that there's, because I think he's about 33, something like that, 35. And I think, you know, what a beautiful thing to have that kind of talent, that kind of ability, that kind of anointing, and still walk humbly before the Lord. So we're going to get to experience that next Saturday. Um, today would be the last day you can tell us if you want to come to that. I'm so happy to say that there's been some teams that have really plugged in. Noah, and I'm not, I'm not bragging on you, the music particularly, but a lot of those people decided they were going to come to this. And a lot of our teachers and greeters and, and things like that. So talk to your team. And what a blessing that was to see that. That, you know, you know, that deeper and higher thing. So that's a blessing. So also, too, let's see. And he'll be preaching Sunday also. Yeah. Max will be preaching for us on Sunday. And uh, he told us the other day that he does believe that his family is going to be with him. So that will be a blessing also. Um, March Coffee and Combo, I, I had to miss Friday, but I heard it was great. You ever hear those messages where you people say, church was so good because the preacher didn't preach? I had to miss this. My they had a good time without me, Cindy. They had a good time without me. I heard Caleb brought the word. True? No? Hey, I had no complaints. I had all, all positive. But we're going to be meeting again, and there is a tile for that, too, also, for Coffee and Combo. But the next one is, well, we're always on the second and fourth Fridays. So the second and fourth Fridays, come and join and be with us through the month of March. 
the month of April in particular, I want to start telling you about. We are going to do a Lisa Bevere book called Godmothers. You either are one or you need to get one. Can somebody say amen to that? And we're going to be uh, going over that topic. Miss Teresa is going to be teaching for us. And we're not going to rush through that. We're going to let the Holy Spirit have his way. And uh, But that will be for starting in April. Uh, Wednesday night, we have connect groups around this church. I've told you last Sunday, and I'll tell you again this Sunday. If you want to see a blessing, uh, an amazing uh, orchestration of God in action, you need to go next door on Sunday or Wednesdays and watch the activity upstairs and downstairs and in all these classrooms to watch these people present the gospel to our children who we believe that we're kingdom building. Yes? We believe we're kingdom building. And so go on, tell the security team, like I said, if you want to walk through, they need to make sure, you know, what are you doing? Hey, hey. <laughs> but, uh, but do that. Take the opportunity to go over there. But Wednesdays are classes for every age, and God has been moving in a mighty way. We have a very good number that attend even adult class. So let's see. Everyone stand up. Um, now, did you hear the way I said that? <laughs> Miss Cindy's going to preach this morning. Can we give the Lord a hand clap? We're going to do something a little different today. We're going to do an actual and for real meet and greet. Can somebody cheer? Come on. Yeah. Now, you don't have to get out if you're a visitor and shake hands with anybody. But today, if you're over here and you see somebody all the way over there, you are actually allowed to go say hi to them today. Come on, let's take about 60 seconds and, and greet one another. Go on. Go on. Look at that. I feel like I should snap a picture of this. We haven't done this in over a year. Bless the Lord. God, you're so good. Say hello to a guest over there.
brother for lying. But the chorus goes like that. It says, you are Jaira. You are enough. I wanted to share this morning and say, if you think that you're not enough, you're right. But let me tell you, God is enough. God is enough. God is enough. He is Jehovah Jireh. He is the provider. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. This morning, right now, go ahead and tell him, say, God, you are enough. You are enough, Lord. You are enough.
Come on, saints. Come on, saints. Oh, come on. Come on, right now. Lift up your hands. Come on. Help me, guys. Help me. Just lift up your hands for a moment. Glorify the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. We just want to take a moment and open up our house, God, and let you know how good you are, how holy you are, how righteous you are, how worthy of our praise you are. Amen. Oh, come on, say that. I believe. Jesus Christ. 
is an obstacle remover. It'll remove obstacles in our life. And I'm so glad he's a demolition expert. Yeah. The Bible says that he destroys the yoke. And did you know that that word in Hebrew talking about destroying the yoke literally means to grind to a powder, to pulverize it. He doesn't break the yoke, he destroys the yoke. So broken, something broken can be rebuilt, can be repaired. I've done some of that fixing before, haven't you? When something's broken, but man, when something is pulverized, crushed, destroyed, that's it. It's over. It's done. It's done. And aren't you glad that the Lord sets us free that those who the Son have made free are free indeed? Praise the Lord. You remember when he removed your yoke? You remember when he set you free? Maybe, maybe you need to go back and ask, Lord, remind me when I was in sin and I was bound when you set me free. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. It is a great pleasure and joy this morning to have Cindy Bowman is going to be preaching this morning. She's been leading in prayer ministry here at the church. Outreaches. Sometimes we've had in the past prayer outreaches. And Cindy's been there with the team. It's a part of the prayer ministry. Cindy is an ordained minister in the church of God. I appreciate the fact that in the church that I, I will tell you as pastor that those who get behind this pulpit will be discipled people, people who have supported a part of this church, people who have paid the price. Because I will tell you, it's a sacred thing to get up and preach the gospel. Now, I didn't say perfect people, and we're all a work in progress, but there must be a progress that has achieved. And there are those who have, uh, and Cindy Bowman is one who has achieved that progress and proven her ministry and her work in the Lord. So without any further ado, would you welcome our very own Cindy Bowen, who's going to share the gospel this morning. God bless you, Mrs. You know, that wasn't what was on 
of the word that he might present her to himself. A glorious church. A glorious church. Not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. But that she should be holy and without blemish before him in love. Jesus is all in for us. Why wouldn't we be all in? It is my privilege to pick up that thread of our pastor's vision this morning for our church in the season. That word that I did, the Holy Spirit put his finger on and preached to you this morning. My passion, all in the place of prayer. Hallelujah. Pray with me this morning, church. Father, we come to you and we adore you. We praise you. You are the God of the breakthrough. You are able to do all things, Lord. I ask you to, to, to clearly enunciate what you want to say. That you draw us into the secret place again. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Folks, I'm going to be in uh, the, the book of 2 Kings chapter 4 this morning. And then we'll swing back around the songs again as we wrap it all up. And if it sounds like to you that I didn't understand the assignment that we're supposed to be talking about prayer, just wait for it because we are. It just may not be apparent at first. We're going to be talking about the story, the account in Scripture of this little little woman in her desperation. And, and, and in this woman's uh, narrative, this is the defining narrative by her life, uh, about her life, by the way. This is who we remember her as, but this defined how the rest of her life was going to go. I, I want to go call special attention to four people, four characters, four players in this woman's story, starting in verse 1. Now the wife of the son of the prophets cried to Elisha. He's the first person. Your servant, my husband, is dead, was number two. And you know that your servant feared the Lord, but the creditor, number three, has come to take my two sons to be slaves. Now this is a woman in a desperate place, a desperate situation. Number one, Elisha is her greatest hope. Number two, her dead husband is her greatest sorrow. Number three, the creditor is her greatest fear. And number four, her sons are the great desperation to drive down this little mama's life. The woman's in a desperate state the situation with no way out. So she gathers up her courage. She she takes off her game face. You know, we get a church face on. I don't know if you notice that. But you walk in here, and I could be dying inside. You ask me how I am, and I'm going to say, Glenn, Glenn, I'm fine. I'm peachy. That's my word. I'm peachy. And, and we get a game face on. We come in here, and we're a, a whole room full of, of fine people. And, and you know what? Sometimes I just need you to reach over and pray for me. Sometimes I just need you to reach over and, 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 and say, I got you. I understand. I'll listen to you. I love you. I love you even when you're a mess. But this woman takes off her game face. She lays down her dignity. And she goes to Elisha. Because he is the representative of God to the nation. Just to, just to remind you that Elisha has come into the prophetic mantle. Because God spoke to Elijah, the man who called fire down on Mount Carmel. He said, go and anoint the king of Israel, the, the king of, of, of uh, Syria. And by the way, anoint uh, Elisha to be the prophet in your place. And I would like to think. That, that, that mentorship looks a lot like this spiritual uh, school that Elisha went through, that he went in and, and he went through these spiritual exercises with Elijah. But the Bible tells me he poured water on the man's hand. He was the servant. He was the one. He was the one. <laughs> he was the one that if Elijah was thirsty, he would go get the water from the well. If Elijah said, we got to go somewhere, He's the one who uh, who uh, uh, pitched the tent. You know, it was a lot of me, wasn't it? <laughs> Elisha was the one who did the labor, and he walked with Elijah. And, and you know, sometimes people feel a call of God in their lives, and the call is perfectly. 
be perfectly real. But they don't understand. They get offended when they come and they, they want to minister and, and they get the van keys. Here, go, go, go wash that thing. And, and, and pick up the children and, and bring them to, to Wednesday night services. And, and they get the vacuum cleaner. Hey, why don't you why don't you throw this out in the foyer? We had illness this morning. There's some crumbs down in the carpet. Uh, you feel a call to ministry? Well, go out there and mend that vacuum cleaner for a little while. <laughs> but 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 if you will serve God in the little things, He can trust you with the big things. If He can't trust you with the big things, He can't give you a pulpit. If He can't trust you with a vacuum cleaner, He's not going to give you a platform. God has to be able to trust you. And Elisha has come through this. And Elijah has gone to heaven. And now Elisha. Elisha is the man who is the representative of God to the people. He, uh, he's the prophetic voice. He's God's voice to the nation. When God has something to say to the king, he's going to go talk to Elisha. And Elisha's going to go. So can you imagine that Elisha's a busy man? Elisha is the head of the school of the prophets. And the school of the prophets is this band of anointed young men who were being trained to bring uh, reform to an apostate nation. And, and, and he's the head of that. This is a busy man. You couldn't just drop by the, by the, uh, the church because you saw his car was out front. You had to make an appointment. He was busy. He was important. But this was a desperate woman. This was a desperate woman, and she doesn't have a way out. She doesn't have another option, or she would have taken it. So she comes to Elisha, but when she gets there, she identifies both her reason and her right. She has a reason to be there, her sorrow. She has a right. There's a relationship. Her husband was one of the sons of the prophets. He was one of Elisha's protégés. And he was a good man. He was a godly man. And together, they were building a life in the shadow of the prophetic movement in the nation. They were doing something together. Uh, but, but now her sorrow has come. There is a spiritual relationship. And she still went to the man of God. But, um, but her husband is dead. She's just not just a, a grieving woman. She's a grieving widow. She had lost the head of her house. The man who was uh, the priest of the home. She's lost the one who went to God for them. The one who made the financial uh, 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 decisions. The one who took care of her and her boys. Uh, he was the one who was going to teach them how to be men of God. And follow in their daddy's footsteps. And, and he's gone. And she's lost her vision for the future. She's lost her, uh, her understanding of what the picture is supposed to look like now. The pretty picture is broken. And she doesn't know what to do. She doesn't know what to do, but she knows what direction to run in. So she goes to Elisha, the man of God. This is not just a grieving widow. This is a mama. And she is in trouble. And I don't know about you. I mean, gentlemen, I'm sorry. I don't know what it's like for daddies. But I know what it's like to be mommy bear. <laughs> I know what it's like to see your son and, and, or your daughter and, and, and we're in trouble and something in you rises up and you're going to go defend that baby. Ain't nobody going to hurt my, my boys. Ain't nobody going to say too much because mama bear's here. I have to tell you, and I'm telling them myself, there was a time when little bitty Cody was out there on the t-ball field and he had, his, he had his little glove and his little bat that I bought him and, and boy, he was cute. And I was up in the bleachers, and I noticed all of a sudden, it looks like that coach is yelling at somebody. It looks like that coach is getting down and yelling. And when I shifted to the side, I saw that coach was down there yelling at Cody. And I have to tell you, the only reason Mama Bear wasn't in the newspaper that day or getting jail, built out of jail was there was a chain link fence between me and that man down in the coach's face. Mama Bear has to take care of business. Mama bears what this boy's got. Mama bears gonna do something. Now I have to tell you, this is a mommy in trouble. Her greatest fear, her greatest desperation, her greatest sorrow is in front of her. She's a grieving mama. The creditor has come, and he has a claim. He has a claim on her house. He has a claim on her future. He has a claim on her children. And when you look in the original language, this was not the OBD loan officer. This was not the farmer's bank loan specialist. 
This was the predatory man. This is the man that they went to in the back of the back street and said, I need a favor. This was a man who gave you what you needed, but there was a cost. There was a price tag involved, and it might be higher than you want to pay. But the man has a claim on our house. And I want you to see who this man is. He has no compassion. He's a man without God. I know it because God said you can't pay. The Israelites couldn't pay an Israelite as a slave. But he didn't mind what God was saying. Uh, the book of Exodus it says, uh, you have compassion and you shall not afflict the widow and the fatherless child. And you know what he was going about to do? He was about to put shackles on those little wrists and chains on those little ankles and drag them off to the slave yard. He was about to put those boys to hard labor. This was an ungodly man, and she would have no compassion in his eyes. And then there's those boys. That's her world. That's her sunlight in the dark time. Uh, that, that's the, the thing she'll give anything for. Her most valuable position. Mommies invest their whole lives in their babies, don't we, mommy? Our whole lives are invested in those little little ones. And with our whole point is to get them to the place where they can fly away and get their wings. But it's our whole life paying the life. This mommy is desperate. And those kids, those are her hopes of the future. In this culture, in this culture, when mommy gets old and nobody else takes care of her, those kids are going to take care of her. This is her everything. So she came to Elisha, the man of God, and brought him her greatest sorrow. He brought, she brought him her greatest uh, uh, fear, her greatest desperation. Hearing from heaven was the only hope this woman had. Yeah. Verse 1 again. Now the wife of a son of the prophets cried to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord. But the creditors come to take my two sons to be his slave. And Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me what you have in your house. And I imagine her face if I were there. Didn't you listen to what I just said? Don't, don't you know I just said I don't have anything? He says to her, your hand, uh, what do you, tell me, what have you in the house? And she said, your handmaid has nothing in the house except a jar of oil. You can't even make bread with just oil. Oh, God, it's a little bit of oil. It's everything I've got. Can't you imagine her saying, Elisha, I'm too listen and I'm broke. I don't have anything about you. If I had something I could sell, I'd have already done it. You wouldn't be looking at me if I had another way out of this mess. But she says, all oh, right, got a little oil. Verse 3. Then he said, go around and borrow vessels from your neighbors. Empty vessels and not a few. And when you come in, you shut the door upon you and your sons and pour out the oil that you have into all those vessels, setting aside each one when it is full. You know, that doesn't make a bit of sense at all. But the little woman said, this is my chunk. I'm hearing out of heaven. I'm going to do what the prophet says. So she goes to her neighbor. Hey, have you got a pitcher I can borrow? Have you got a bowl? Are there any mason jars in the little sink right now? Uh, do you have a barrel? Hey, you see that, that bucket over there? Can I, I, I know I'll wash it out, but can I have the, that bucket over there? Uh, and she goes to the other side. Hey, I'll even take your pans. You got a Kool-Aid pitcher in the shelf? I'll take the Kool-Aid pitcher. I'll take your bowls. Whatever you got, I'll take it. I'll take it. No, I don't need your sugar. I don't need a cup of sugar and a couple of eggs. I don't need a handful of milk from you. You don't understand. You don't have anything in your possession that is going to make a difference in my life right now. You don't have what I need. All I need is some capacity. All I need is some empty vessel. I need something to hold what God's going to do. And you know, I'm sure those, those neighbors said, hey, what are you doing? Are you crazy? I know you don't have anything. Why do you want my bowls? And, and, and they want to talk about it. And what are you doing? And she says, I don't have time to talk to you. If I sit down and tell you how bad it is, if I tell you uh, how I'm broken, if I tell you this fear that has gripped my soul, you're going to try to talk me out of my miracle. I can't afford to talk to you. I'll tell you what it does tomorrow. But today, just give me your capacity. Just give me something to 
secret way. Come and shut the door and get in secret with me and know that I can change you and I can change exactly what you are dealing with right now. Know that I am your God and you are my prized possession and you are the vessel I desire to seal so that you will see my miracle working
if you put that phone in the other room, if, if, that's, not, if that's your music, put it over where you can't reach it when you get down on the floor. And you put that thing away and you start lavishing love on God. He fills the prayer closet. You must be intentional in your prayer closet. And I don't know about you, but I want God to be intentional in my life. He told me that. He told me that years ago in my prayer closet. I was in here, I didn't believe. And he said, if you will be intentional with your time, I will be intentional with my presence. I want the presence of God. I need the presence of God in my life. You have to be intentional. And all I am doing is going to work so I can pay bills. And that's my whole life. That's a sad little life. That's a sad little life. That's a breathless life. Amen. You know what? A prayerless life is a life with no breath in it. You know what we call it when something doesn't have any breath, but it's walking around. We call that a monster. That's a bad movie. That's a bad movie. If you're a Christian, you're going to have some breath in you. We're going to have the breath in your prayer closet. A prayerless life is a breathless life. We have to be intentional with him. She was intimate. She brought her boys into the room and closed the door. It was in privacy that God multiplied the oil. It was in privacy she got her miracle. When it's just you and God in the room, that's when the miracle happens. That's when he shows up and reveals himself. God's not looking for eloquence or spiritual gymnastics. He's looking for a hungry heart. Isn't that what Jesus told that woman at the well? The Father's looking for such to. To, to worship him. God's seeking out a hungry heart. God wants the worshiper, the one who come and, and talk to him and love on him and they're not just bringing the wish list. God is looking for intimacy. James 4 and 8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Why do I have to be the one of God? I, I, there are mountains in my life I can't, I can't, I can't believe in my faith. I wish I could, I'd have done it already. But he can help me. He can help me. When you read the Gospels, wherever Jesus walked in the room, to ground, that was ground zero for the kingdom of God. That was where the miracle happened. That was where the, the, the deaf ears opened and the blind eyes started seeing. There are some things in my life where I've been deaf and blind, and I don't know what to do and how to get out of this place. Oh, but when Jesus walks in, he's the one who opens eyes. He's the one who opens ears. He's the one who speaks life. I, I, I need that in my life. I need his proximity. This woman was intentional. She was intimate. But she was intense. She was desperate to engage God, and that intensity worked. God is looking for the hungry heart. And if you come to your prayer closet and all you're doing is bringing God your wish list, then you are messing, missing out on the, the, the most beautiful part of prayer. You're missing out on the intimate connection to the Father's heart. If you are bored in your prayer life, Church, you're doing it wrong. You're doing it wrong if you're bored in there. You need to dial up the intensity a little bit on your prayers. And, and can I tell you, sometimes it, it goes against my flesh to do that. Sometimes my flesh comes home and I'm home from work and I'm hungry and I'm a little bit tired and I'm a little bit wanting to complain to anybody who will listen because I had a hard day at work. And, and I come in there and, and, and Holy Spirit says, won't you come pray? And my flesh gets in the way. My flesh doesn't want to be intense. My flesh wants a recliner. But I can have the recliner if that's what I want. I don't want the recliner. I want the living God. David, the man after God's heart, wrote in the book of Psalms, chapter 63, verse 1, Oh God, you are my God. I shall seek you earnestly. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh yearns for you in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. Psalms 42 and 1. Here's David again. As the deer pants after the water brook, so panteth my soul after you. You're the one thing. That's the, that's the verse of my, of my prayer calls, it, folks. Psalms 27 and 4. One thing have I asked of the Lord, and that will I seek, inquire for, and insistently require, that I might dwell in the house of the Lord, that I might dwell in proximity to God, that I can get in his presence all the days of my life to gaze on his beauty and to inquire, meditate, and consider in his temple. Jesus promised those who hunger and thirst. So 
So let me reel this thing on in. Those donuts have to be getting a little on. We, we're going to let it reel it in. Being all in the prayer and not punching the top of it. You come in and punch and you do your duty and you do your 10 minutes and you walk out as a leader with him. It's never going to satisfy your heart or God. God doesn't want you to follow the rules. He wants a relationship with you. It's not bringing the wish list you want God to complete and laying it out in front of him and giving the timeline. You ever done that? God, I need you to do this, and I need it by Monday. I need you to do it my way. It's not bringing that in. That's just manipulation. Prayer isn't a choice. It's the high place. It's the highest calling of mankind to minister to the heart of the living God. God wants a relationship with us. And you know what? I know me. It's wonderful that I would want a relationship with God. That makes sense. He's God. He speaks worlds in the, in the world. He's God. He can do anything. He's thunder and lightning God. But he wants a relationship with me. And I know him. I know all about him. Oh, but he thinks I am. He thinks I am. He wants a relationship. That's the wonder of my life. The secret place is the place of revelation, of inspiration, of infilling and indwelling. It is the power position for the kingdom of God. Intimacy in prayer is the secret to power in prayer. It is the power source of the Christian life and every Christian endeavor. Everything I could do for God in all of my life with all of my strength doesn't compare to what I can do with God. God doesn't want me to do for him. He wants me to do with him. That is found not in the public forum. It is found in the intimacy, in the stillness, in the aloneness with God of your prayer closet, with the door shut. Praying for intimacy is greater and more effective than mere petition outside the doors of a relationship. When I pray until my heart is connected to the heart of God and I see him as he is, I'm changed. Faith rises up within me, up inside of me. My heart is connected to him, and now I can pray right now. Now I'm not telling God how bad that thing is. I'm telling God how big it is. And I'm not it. You know, it changes me. I'm not pushing my, my load up to God on the mountain. I'm up on the mountain with God because the load is not so big anymore. Now it's okay. Church, God is inviting you. Go all in in prayer with me this year. Go all in with me when nobody's looking. Shut your door. Step into the heavenly places in your prayer closet. Close your door. Pour out your oil. He wants to have your heart. He wants to give you the oil. Now I want to ask you this morning. And uh, you know what? You, you, you can make time if you like. I got one here. I want to ask you this morning. How's it going? Are you like this woman today? Are you feeling hedged in and desperate? Has fear become your companion? Has sorrow consumed your life? And you're desperate and you don't know a way out. First things first, this woman had a relationship. She had a reason she could go to God. It was a relationship. God, does God hear a sinner's prayer? I believe he does. He was he 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 heard me. He heard me. I believe he does. But God, more than anything, wants your heart, and he wants the relationship with you. So I want to ask you this morning, how is your relationship with the Lord? I have found that my relationship with Jesus is good in the bad times, and he's good in the good times. He's sweet every morning. When everything's going south, I got him. And when I'm on top of the mountain, I got him. My life is good because of God. And a day is going to come when we're on my journey and we're all on the journey and we all have an end of the journey that is coming. And when you reach the end of your journey and I reach the end of mine, I'm going to stand in front of God. You're going to stand in front of God and he's not going to ask you how much money did you make. He's not going to ask you how many baseball games you took your kids to. He's not going to ask you about your career or those things that we chase. He's not even going to ask you about your favorite TV series that you're binging right now. He's not going to ask you any of those things. He's going, when you stand in front of God, he's going to ask you one thing. 
What did you do with Jesus? What did you do with the Lord? The gospel in its most succinct form is this, that Jesus, the sinless Son of God, was beaten and crucified, died on a rough, rugged cross, and he did it not because he deserved it, but because I did it. Because I deserve hell. Because I deserve the penalty of my sin. And you deserve the penalty of yours. None of us deserve heaven. None of us are good enough. We can't do it. But Jesus was good enough. And when he died on the cross, he did it for us. It was our sins that put him there. But Jesus wasn't just the sacrifice. He is the resurrected Lord. He is God the Son, and death cannot hold him. And on the third day, when the soldiers were guarding a tomb with a dead man inside, that roll, that stone started rolling away, and Jesus walked on that mountain. Jesus is God, and Jesus has no hypocrisy. And all you have to do, believe. He said, believe. What do I do to work in the works of God? Believe on him who the Father has sent. God so loved the world that gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And therefore the Father did not send the Son into the world uh, to condemn the world, but rather that it should be saved. The Lord is preaching this morning. And I don't know your hearts. I know, I know a lot of you. But I don't know your heart. Do you have the relationship that when things are hard, you can go and say, I'm coming in because I have a covenant. I'm coming in because Jesus died for me. I'm coming in and I need you. Oh, but I've got you. I've got you and I know you're going to walk a mile more. If that's you this morning, church, just go ahead and bow your head. Let's give some, uh, let's give some privacy to people. You can have 